Hi students and welcome to your first lecture on CRISPR in section 4. In this section, we will first describe how the CRISPR system was discovered, then explain how CRISPR-Cas systems work as an adaptive immune system in bacteria. Next, we will explain how CRISPR has been modified and adapted as a tool for genome editing in eukaryotic cells. And then finally, describe some of the applications of CRISPR-Cas technology. So let's first talk about the background. When we talk about innate immunity, we talk about an internal system that can be used to defend against foreign pathogens. So innate immunity is an internal system. And restriction enzymes, which were first discovered in bacteria, are a form of innate immunity. The restriction enzyme coding sequences are fixed, and therefore protein structure remains stable for long periods of time. And so these don't change very rapidly. However, when we discuss adaptive immunity, we talk about a form of immunity that can change or adapt when exposed to new or different pathogens. So for example, vaccines allow people to adapt to new viruses as we as humans have an adaptive immune system. CRISPR was first discovered when scientists were investigating bacterial immunity. And CRISPR is a form of adaptive immunity that evolved in bacteria. The CRISPR system has now been manipulated and developed into a tool for genetics and molecular biology research. CRISPR is a genomic locus in bacteria that contains clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. And the name CRISPR was derived from the sequence itself. So when we talk about clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats, we are referring to the CRISPR locus itself. This diagram shows the CRISPR locus. If we look at these regions in dark blue, these are the repeat sequences. And these repeat sequences are also palindromic in nature, which means that they can fold back onto themselves. These are clustered into a singular locus within a bacterial genome and can be transcribed at the same time. These CRISPR loci have been identified in 40% of bacterial species and in 90% of archaea, which we know is another type of prokaryote. Now let's discuss the nature of these repeat sequences. If you look at the repeat sequence in Streptococcus thermophilus, GTTTT, GTAC, I've repeated the sequence over here. There are two regions in the sequence that makes this palindromic in nature. There's a TT, GTAC on the left side of the sequence and a GTA, CAA sequence on the right side of the sequence. So if you were to look at these two sequences, you'd see that they have sequence identity, which means that it can fold back over on itself. So whilst this middle section in black does not bind to each other, these two regions of six nucleotides can form a palindrome within the repeat sequence. And so we have this structure, which is also referred to as a hairpin structure that forms in each of these repeat sequences. And therefore, the repeat sequence is palindromic in nature due to the fact that it can fold back over onto itself like this. Now let's talk about the spacer sequences. Within the CRISPR locus, we have these repeat sequences in dark blue. And between each of the repeat sequences, we also have spacer regions. And these spacer regions have sequence identity to bacteriophages. And so they serve as a molecular memory of previous viral attacks. Now, if we were to look at the spacer regions in Streptococcus thermophilus, you'll see here that spacer one has sequence identity to Streptococcus phage 20617. And spacer two has sequence identity to phage CHPPC11. 5, 1. 
and the third spacer region has sequence identity to Streptococcus phage TP778L. So each of the spacer regions are different, however they share sequence identity to phages that have previously attacked this bacterium. And therefore it serves as a molecular memory of previous viral attacks. So how were CRISPR systems first discovered? This bacterium, Esthemophilus, was exposed to a specific phage. And some of the bacterial cells that survived were able to become resistant to that same strain of the bacteriophage. However, they were not resistant to other phage strains. The resistant bacteria had new spacer regions within their CRISPR loci and the spacer regions contained an exact sequence match to some of the phage genome for the strain of the bacteriophage that they were exposed to. Deleting these spacer regions in the bacteria, CRISPR locus, led to these strains becoming susceptible to the bacteria again. So they've lost their resistance to the phage after the spacer regions were deleted. Then the next part of the experiment was to insert new viral sequence derived spaces into CRISPR loci of sensitive bacteria. And even though these bacteria were not exposed to these phages before, they developed resistance to these viruses by experimental insertion of the viral sequence into the spacer regions of their CRISPR loci. So what this tells us is that CRISPR is in fact an adaptive immune system in bacteria. How does CRISPR work? So the mechanism of CRISPR is an RNA guided destruction of invading DNA. In addition to the RNA, adaptive immunity is also dependent on a set of CRISPR associated genes, and these are called CAS genes. These Cas genes encode Cas proteins, which have DNA's or RNA's properties. And so the Cas proteins are able to cleave invading DNA's or RNA's from foreign viral particles. Now let's look at this mechanism in more detail. Briefly, there are three main steps to the CRISPR-Cas mechanism of action. The first step is spacer acquisition. So that's acquiring the spacer regions from infecting viral or phage particles. The next step in this process is CRISPR RNA biogenesis. So the CRISPR locus would have to be transcribed. Once the CRISPR locus containing both the repeat as well as the spacer regions have been transcribed, these are processed into mature CRISPR RNA. And these mature CRISPR RNAs will associate with a Cas9 protein in order to target infecting viral particles. Now let's look at these in more detail. The first step, which is spacer acquisition, involves cleavage of phage DNA. So the phage would infect the bacterium and insert its DNA into the bacteria. Phage DNA would be cleaved by Cas9 enzymes into smaller fragments. And these small fragments that it's cleaved into are called protospaces. These protospaces are then inserted into CRISPR loci to become new spacer regions. So the first step, spacer acquisition, involves acquiring or being infected by a phage. Phage DNA is then cleaved or chopped up into smaller pieces and incorporate it into the CRISPR locus. After they are incorporated into the CRISPR locus, the repeat sequences are duplicated so that each spacer is flanked by two repeat regions. Spacer acquisition therefore involves acquiring or incorporating these spacer regions into the, CRIS into the CRISPR locus. The next step is the CRISPR RNA or CRRNA biogenesis. CR biogenesis or CRISPR RNA biogenesis 
involves transcription of the spacer and repeat regions. The promoter will first bind to a sequence within the leader region, and the remaining portions in dark blue and light blue are then transcribed into long RNA transcripts. So here we have a long CRISPR RNA transcript, and this is called pre-CRISPR RNA. The pre-CRISPR RNA is then processed further by cleavage somewhere in the middle of these repeat sequences. And so what we end up having is a mature CRISPR RNA, which contains a spacer region, a full spacer region, flanked on either side by portions of the repeat sequence. Finally, for target interference, these mature CRISPR RNAs will then associate with a Cas protein or nuclease. Once CRISPR RNAs associate with the Cas protein or Cas nuclease, this complex is then involved in targeting viral DNA in order to neutralize viral infection. And this summarizes the mechanism of adaptive immunity in prokaryotes. There are various types of CRISPR-Cas systems. Type 1 and type 3 CRISPR systems require multi-subunit protein complexes. And when we talk about these protein complexes, we're talking about the Cas enzymes. So we need a multi-subunit complex to mediate the RNA-guided viral DNA destruction during the interference step. However, type 2 CRISPR-Cas systems are a bit simpler. And that's because in type 2 systems, only one Cas9 protein is sufficient to perform both of these functions. And these Cas9s play a role in both acquiring the spacer regions as well as in CRISPR RNA biogenesis. During spacer acquisition, Cas9 is able to cleave the invading viral DNA. And Cas9 selects protospacer sequences that are flanked by a protospacer adjacent motif or a PAM motif. A PAM motif is defined by the sequence 5' prime to 3' prime NGG. Now N can stand for any nucleotide and we have a GG dinucleotide. So these protospacer regions are selected by Cas9 only if they have an NGG motif. Once the protospacer, which is the infecting viral DNA, has been cleaved, a Cas1 and Cas2 complex integrates these spacer regions into the CRISPR locus within bacterial DNA. Now let's talk about the role of Cas9 during CRISPR RNA biogenesis. The tracer RNA is a non-coding RNA that's called transactivating CRISPR RNA, tracer. These transactivating RNAs or tracer RNAs will bind to a repeat region in the CRISPR RNA. Now remember that the CRISPR RNA will have a spacer region as well as some portion of the repeat sequence on either side of the CRISPR RNA. And when the tracer RNA binds to the CRISPR RNA, it can be recognized by a Cas9 protein. And this Cas9 protein will then associate with the CRISPR and tracer RNA. Due to the fact that the tracer RNA forms these double-stranded RNA regions, an RNA such as RNAs3 can recognize this and cleave this double-stranded RNA. And so now what we'll have is multiple Cas9 proteins containing both CRISPR and tracer RNA. And these form what's called a ribonucleoprotein complex. So now that we've formed the ribonucleoprotein complex with the CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA, it can now be used for target DNA interference. Within the Cas9 protein, there are two nuclease domains the HNH domain and the RUVC domain. So when this ribonucleoprotein complex comes into contact with viral DNA that has sequence identity with the CRISPR RNA, it will then bind to the viral DNA particle. 
The HNH domain will then cleave the strand of viral DNA that's complementary to the CRISPR RNA, and the RUVC domain cleaves the other strand, the non-complementary strand. Also, this Cas9 enzyme will only cleave the viral DNA if the target viral particle is adjacent to a PAM sequence. So the PAM motif has to be present in the viral DNA in order for the enzyme to cleave that sequence. And that's why the spacer regions have to have a PAM motif as well. So we've spoken about CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA forming a complex that's required to bind to the Cas9 enzyme. Now, if we wanted to replicate the system in vitro or in a lab, what we can do is create a CRISPR tracer RNA hybrid. So the tracer RNA and CRISPR RNA can be linked to each other by a short loop of a few nucleotides. And this tracer CRISPR RNA hybrid is called a single guide RNA which is usually about 20 nucleotides long. So the single guide RNA or sgRNA can then associate with the Cas enzyme as it has both the tracer and CRISPR RNA sequences required for Cas to perform its function. And these sequences, for example, the sgRNA sequence as well as the sequence for the gene that encodes the Cas enzyme can be incorporated into expression vectors. And these expression vectors can be inserted into a eukaryotic cell so that this CRISPR-Cas9 system can function within eukaryotic cells. The sgRNA can be modified to contain any sequence that we want the CRISPR enzyme to target. And this can therefore be used for targeted genome editing in eukaryotic cells. And this is what we will discuss in the next lecture. Thank you.